it in mind. Good evening and welcome. We are ready for Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're skipping forward a little bit. Some of the themes of chapter 6 we've covered. I don't see taking the time. You can read it. It's taking the time to tell us that if we work hard and don't have people to leave it to, then it's vanity. And putting our emphasis on work is vanity. So some of the themes are similar. I just didn't feel like we needed to spend the time on it. But chapter 7 introduces several things, and these are verses that you have seen and read before, I would be certain to say. Uh, more common verses for general study and maybe references in different circumstances. Ecclesiastes 7 uh, we've checked with family in Waco. They're without power. We've checked with Wendy's mom in Houston. She's been without power since Monday. Uh, Eric, they have a community where the lines are underground, so it's five degrees, but they have power. So uh, they live in a newer community, I suppose, and the power lines are not exposed to the branches that are covered with ice and breaking. Um, but it's a tough road out there for a lot of people right now. And if you have family in those situations, hopefully they'll have power soon, and maybe it's come on here at the end of the day. But uh, it's, it's cold, and we are blessed. If you didn't know it, we're the hot spot of Alabama, we were told, when we visited my, uh, my sister and her husband in Montgomery prior to coming. Andalusia is always the hottest spot in Alabama when they see the Montgomery forecast they automatically show the southern part and so far that's been true every single time it's one degree or more hotter everywhere else now I haven't looked to see what Montgomery is today um, I know it's cold but I haven't looked to know whether that's true here in the winter months Solomon makes a statement in each of them represents something of a paradox that you have to listen to it and hear it and then think about it. And there's a reason why it's true. He believes it to be true. I do too. But we have to come to grips with how can that be true? Some of them easier than others. He said a good name is better than fine perfume. Now, we've heard that before. If you've ever studied Proverbs, this one is referenced to some extent with slightly different words. Um, why is a good name important? If we answer that question, we know why it's better than fine perfume. Why is a good name so important? It represents who you are. It represents who your family is. It goes back to a legacy that maybe that name has established. And I've told you already several weeks ago, I think, that I live regularly and think about often that I don't want to do anything that would embarrass my dad if he were still alive. But that's because of my name, but it's also attached, of course, to my dad. Your name means something. A good name means something. And if you don't understand that, if you maybe are kind of, uh, I don't think you're denying it, but maybe you don't appreciate it the way you could, think about what a bad name means. Benedict Arnold, Judas. Uh, think of the bad names in history. When you hear them, it's a negative. There's no question about it. And so when you hear a bad name, Someone's family name that is, a, is a Jesse James. I'm just trying to think of others. When you hear a bad family name, it immediately speaks loudly to you. You understand it. But a good family name matters even more. And as costly as fine perfume is, and that's what it's comparing. Think about the, the finest perfume that you could buy, whatever it is per ounce, and I have no clue. Uh, I have no clue what some of the finer perfumes would cost. But the finer perfumes and the value or the cost to afford them 
is nothing compared to a good name. And fine perfume is the smell is here and gone. The tear and I tease each other from time to time. I wear cologne on Sunday morning and Wednesday night before I come to the building. I'll spray some Stetson on. I've worn that for years. Nothing fancy. I usually go after the holidays and get it when it's half price. But Terry says, I think the preacher's here. And I bought her something. I forget what it is. And it's something she had trouble finding. Where we were about nine years ago, there were three bottles of it. And I said, I want all three. You do like this, right? She says, oh, I do, and I have trouble finding. I bought all three bottles because I liked it as much as she liked it. And when she uses it, I don't smell it just a few moments after she sprays it, and maybe I walk in behind her. But I'm sure it's still there, still fragrance. But a fine perfume doesn't last very long. The fragrance is short-lived, um, and others might appreciate it, and it may last longer than I'm remembering, and the finer perfumes perhaps, but a good name has a length attached to it. It has a quality that's attached to it, and that's what Solomon's want, wanting us to realize. Uh, day of death is better than the day of birth. Now that one's harder to figure out. When you're born, you have your whole life ahead of you, but there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of, of uh, expectation, but it's not real. It's, it's just there to come. The day of your death is dealing with realities. You see the conclusion of the matter, if you will. It's set set in stone, if you will. The day of death is something that can be determined and looked at and rehearsed and remembered, and it has a quality attached to it. The day of birth, he, he's not suggesting that he's uh, uh, concerned about death, he's over-concerned about it or whatever. It's just simply saying that the day of your birth, there's so much ahead but no certainty about it. Uh, and that's not intending to compare the two other than just to make a statement about the reality of those two days, if you will. And uh, the expectation compared to the reality of something gives it an importance. It's an established fact, if you will. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Someone who is always laughing, telling jokes. What could be said of their life if that tends to be the habit of their life? How would you answer that? Never serious. Never serious. Mary said, never serious. And I have family members that are that way through much of their life. They just don't ever seem to get serious about things. And that doesn't mean you can't ever laugh. It's not suggesting laughter is wrong, but it's suggesting that sometimes to be in a house of feasting doesn't provide the depth that the house of mourning can provide. I said to young people for years, I would still say it, but I'm not around 1,200 students in China or others in a congregation where I'm in front of the young people a lot. But I'm convinced young adults up need to go to a funeral regularly because you are forced to look at your life. You're forced to see how you're living your life. You are brought to the reality of your mortality there's value when you're able to see and acknowledge death. And uh, obviously it's painful and hurtful and, and all of the other things depending on the circumstances. But to live your whole life without any pain, suffering, uh, anything of that nature, it doesn't give you an appreciation for those things in life. That pain or separation 
those type things, it, it forces it upon you. When is it that you appreciate your health the most? When you've never been sick for five years? Or when you've just been sick for about two weeks and you're finally able to get up and go out again? When do you appreciate it the most? Human nature is you appreciate it the most when you don't have it and you long for it. And when you have it again, you have a great appreciation for what you once may have had for many years. Uh, I'm rarely sick. I went from the sixth grade through the twelfth grade of high school, never missed a day, except for half a day every once in a while. Uh, but it wasn't for sickness, it was for some extra thing that the school allowed. Uh, I, I get two colds a year. Usually if I feel it coming on, I take medicine, go to bed, and spend several hours the first day, and I'm good to go the rest of the week. I just kind of fight through the worst of it, if you will, as it's beginning. I just don't get sick, but I am type 2 diabetic. I tell the doctors I'm in great health, except I have one of the three deadly diseases, uh, but I'm managing and all of that. I don't think of myself as being in poor health, but I'm aware of it because I'm taking medicine every day, and I don't get to eat certain things. So that keeps me aware of it, even though I don't go through periods of sickness very often at all. But I appreciate it because I have the, the shadow of it there to remind me. And you can understand that, I'm sure. Uh, laughter is a great blessing, and the word enjoy in those first six chapters, several times, God gave us and gives us the ability to enjoy life, to enjoy the fruits of our work, to enjoy family. Several of those things have been major themes. Laughter is all right. Enjoyment's great. It's from God. But it's okay, too, to acknowledge that if you're to have the only one compared to the other, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Now, he tells us why, but we've already tried to answer the reason. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. And that's why we need to read the obit page, if you will. We need to attend a funeral every so often. Hopefully not of close loved ones. That's not the point. But the same thing can come about then. Uh, the hard part of being young is that we think we're going to live forever. The reality of getting a little older, you realize maybe not. Maybe not. And it's just a, a way of thinking. The, the young people, if you ask them, are you going to die one day? Of course I am. But the youngest of people, teenagers, early 20s perhaps, they don't live as if they're invincible. It's as if they're invincible. And their attitudes and the risk that they take and some of that. Um, but that's what he's comparing the two. Where are you going to learn the greater lessons when the hardships come? And you're forced to take life seriously. And you're put on your back metaphorically and totally dependent upon God. How else could you get through this without God and without the prayers of others? And you feel those prayers. You, you know they're there. You feel them. Uh, sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. And so he's expounding upon that principle. It's just okay for us it's good for the heart. The heart is the seed of who we are. Uh, it has to do with our will as well as our emotions. We saw that Sunday. It has to do with uh, the whole realm of who we are. As a man thinketh, so is he in his heart. Uh, there's just more than just blood pumping there and a vital organ in our physical body. It's telling us there's something about that. 
And it, it's who we are, and it's what we're reacting to, and it's what's affecting us. Uh, someone has a hard heart. It's not a heart filled with clogged arteries. A hard heart is what? Someone that's not sensitive to others. Someone that's not empathetic. They're just somewhat mean. A hard-hearted teacher, you don't want to be called that if you're in the teaching profession because you're not perceived as being fair and honest with people. It's not what we want. Soft heart, kind heart, so many other expressions that would come to bear. Then he says, the heart of the wise is in the heart of uh, the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. The same point. Do you think he's trying to make this clear to us? Four times he's dealing with the same central issue. Don't run away from hard times or hard places. There's value in going through them, he's saying. And it's better for you in your individual growth and your adjustment to life as a whole to not always be cheerful and laughing and not having any difficulty. That's what we would long for, but it's not the reality, and therefore there is benefit. And that's why God allows hard times to come. He could control them. He could, could make everything simple and easy for Christians, but that's not the life of a Christian because it wasn't the life of Christ whom we're following. Uh, and we can understand that. Uh, comments there before he changes the basic subject matter, if you will. Do you long for hard times? Do you pray for them? I'm not suggesting that we should. I'm not suggesting that you should. But when you get through them, you have grown, even though it may hurt along the way. You've grown, and hopefully closer to others, dependent upon God. You may have read in Scripture and prayed more during that month or two or a week or two than at any time of your life. And um, that's what he's trying to tell us. As he, he's not in a place, if you will, at this point where he's gone through the neighborhood. We went to the highway, we went to worship, we went to the courtroom, we did other things in chapter 4. He's not really going to a place. He's just talking about life in general in these verses. But it's the value of, compa of comparison of these two things that are part of our life. Uh, I made the notation, the heart is open to instruction when you're going through the hardest times. That's when elders and mentors, ministers, teachers are called upon, can I have some private time? Can I come by tomorrow? It's not usually when things are great. It's when you're wanting to share and have someone express in prayer a concern and show that empathy that you know that's, that's good. It's that uh, metaphorical pat on the back or hug. Uh, but it's real too. It can be a real hug, but it's the pat on the back. We also need the kick in the seat. Uh, and that's true. The opposite is also true. Uh, we need people who'll, who'll come down on us and, and correct us and uh, do those things too. But it's true in all aspects of life. Um, it is better, verse 5, to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. We don't like to be corrected or rebuked. You shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. How could you ever have thought that would be okay? We don't like to hear those type of words. But it's better to hear that because you're hearing it from someone who cares about you, someone who's trying to get you back on the straight and narrow, 
It's better for that person to be doing that than for you to be around somebody that's just foolish in their words and in their applications of life to you. You can't trust them. Oh, you're all right. You, you haven't ever done anything wrong in your life. Would you trust someone who said that to you? Would you go to them in the hardest time? Somebody that has this attitude that, oh, you could never do anything wrong in your life. That's the song of a fool that suggests that nothing could ever be wrong or negative in our life. That's comparing to rebuke. That would be the comparison. Oh, I don't ever have to correct you. You've never done anything that would need correction. Hmm. I would not trust them. Might appreciate it. Not sure I could trust them. Now, we have people that don't require as much as others. Um, Terry was one, and Tanya, our oldest, our only daughter, uh, unmarried daughter, uh, they were the type growing up that all they had to do is somebody just look at them firmly. And, and they, they knew. They were high, uh, uh, I've lost the word, Hmm. I've just lost it completely. Not high maintenance, that's not the word. They were high, uh, high conscience. They just had a, a, a strong conscience. And they just needed a little, just a little direction or a little acknowledgement to wilt and want to do what's right or make it right. Uh, others, seven paddlings in a week. And you're still not sure if they're going to get it. But you love them just the same. And they need it just the same. And the other one needs it just the same. The one with a high conscience. The one that's just high in their awareness of, of right or wrong or wanting to please in a healthy way. Um, better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. And remember, it's a wise man, wise woman. They have your goodwill in mind. They've already given you the benefit of the doubt. They've already tried to examine exactly what is it that's happened, not gossip, but facts. They've already gone through the process to understand the situation. And as that wise person, the rebuke is appropriate. Uh, the best advice we were given, and we followed it as best we could, don't act out in your children's lives based on what you think. Act on what you know. Act on what you know. Uh, sometimes we can think something that's not correct. We can make something more than it really is. And if we slow down and try to let our emotions calm down and get information, we'll act differently then maybe yelling too quickly or punishing too much, we find out that that's not so bad. I overreacted. We don't want to do that very often. It's just not, it's not fair and it's not honest with our children. There were times growing up uh, with our children that we were suspicious of something and Terry wondered, should I go into so-and-so's bedroom while he's at school and see if what we think is true is true. And here's my response to her. I says, if you think you should, you must. But I encourage you to act on what you know. Don't go looking for trouble. And you lose trust. You lose confidence if they know you're doing that. But if you must, get in there. You be true to yourself. But act on what you know, not your emotions or your suppositions. Well, I hear that young people do this, or I know that at this age these things could be happening or whatever. That's supposition. That's rumors. That's gossip. Do those statistics apply to your child? Do you know it to be the case? And act on what you know. But uh, the wise rebuke, there's value in that. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, 
so is the laughter of fools. This too is vanity or meaningless or chasing after the wind, depending on your translation. Um, crackling of thorns under the pot. That's speaking of a fire taking place. What kind of fire is that under a pot? If you're trying to warm chili on a hot Friday night for your family when you're camping out, do you want a crackling fire? Or do you want one that's more of a simmering fire? The crackle has burned down and the embers are at work. It's, it's, it's not the most uh, productive fire if it's the crackling fire under a pot. It gets attention. It looks good in the dark, but it's not accomplishing what you would want it to accomplish. And that's the way a fool's laughter is. It's laughter. It's not to be taken seriously. If you take it actual from Scripture, Proverbs 19.1, a fool says in his heart, there's no God. I'm not sure every time we see a fool in Solomon's writings, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, that is suggesting that that's speaking of someone who doesn't believe in God. It can be someone who acts foolishly without that depth of unbelief attached to it. But he's, in six verses, five different occasions, he's trying to let us see the things that are serious in life and that can have benefit to us compared to shallow moments and shallow times and shallow people. Which ones are better for us? Which ones will benefit us at the time and in time to come? Which of the situations will give us the good name? will help us develop the good name better than fine perfume. He's, he's giving us some reasoning there. Um, extortion turns a wise man into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. Don't have anything to really add. Extortion's a sinful thing. It's, un, uh, it's a criminal thing. A bribe certainly is someone that's using some influence, praise, money, position, to gain some advantage over you. Uh, but I'm not sure what else to suggest. He says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. So there is that admonition to don't let your anger be quick. Don't be quick to let the adrenaline shoot up and you say and do things you regret later. Try to have a measured response to things. How do we do that? If you, when you were younger, were given to quick explosive, if you will, quick reactions to things, what advice did you receive? There's two that I can remember. One of them, slow down and take a deep breath. <sighs> well, if you don't react that first three seconds, it tends to have a good effect. The other thing, similar, count to 10, backwards. And if it needs to be 15 or 20, count to 15 and take a few breaths. It's amazing what that does to the adrenaline, which usually sets our body into motion. It's that sudden shock of adrenaline, of, of anger. It's true of laughter, too. Sometimes we'll just giggle out loud and not realize it was that funny. But to the negative, we will respond to things quickly. And we don't always think and we don't always speak the way we should in those settings. Um, but don't be provoked in your spirit. That's speaking of the unseen part of your human nature. Because anger resides in the lap of fools. It's there. It's ready to respond. A fool doesn't have control when it's in his lap. 
day after day. When, when anger is right there close, instead of it's got to come and find you, if you will, it's very different. Um, we've watched videos with the children all here, except for Andrew, for Thanksgiving. And we talked often. Uh, my dad was a chemist, one of the smartest people I've ever known. And many people said that of him. But when the nine children were there and the 14 grandchildren on some occasions, he was one to just sit quietly and just watch. He tended to just watch. He was always there, always available, always involved in many ways, but he was one in a group to be watching. And it was comforting to have dead there. It was comforting to have his presence. Not only because he's been dead for a while, but just when we were there not even thinking about death. Uh, he wasn't one given to quick anger ever. Um, and th those raised in such an environment, it's a blessing now to his grandchildren. Because we tend to raise our family similarly. Uh, we, we'd make two decisions when we're growing up in our parents' homes, as I would say it. You either say, I want to be a lot like mom and dad, or you say, I will never be like them. It tends to be two extremes. Because the things that really irk you are deep. And you can't ever imagine doing that in your house when you're married and have children. But what happens? My dad lives in my house more often than I would think. Because I find myself doing things in a similar way. If it's good, great. If it wasn't, we tend to become our parents in many, many ways, even though we don't intend to in some ways. And in many ways, obviously, it's a good thing. It's a blessing. But uh, there's a commercial. Um, I think it's Prudential or Geico. I can't remember. But it's Dr. And he's drawing upon the television show of uh, the counselor, Dr. Phil, but he's Dr. Philip. And he has three grown adults, look like they're maybe in their middle 20s, and his task is to follow them around and encourage them not to be like their parents. And the, the way he does it is comical. You have to really think about it. What, did my parents ever do that? I don't really think they did, but the point is, they are doing things that aren't what you ought to be doing, and he's surmising that they learned it from their parents. And so the commercial is Dr. Philip is guiding them through. He's in a hardware store. He's with one young man who's trying to help someone back out of a, dry, uh, of a parking lot, just different circumstances, and he's trying to encourage them not to follow the bad example that they receive from their parents. Uh, but anyway, I don't know how I got onto that. Um, you were probably wondering how to. I understand. Um, verse 10, I haven't heard in a while. I was made aware of this verse many years ago, and so I took it to heart, I think. Have you ever been guilty of saying, well, the good old days? Oh, I long for the good old days. So every of you shaking your head. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions or to make such statements. If you turn it around to a statement rather than a question. Would we want the good old days? The principles that we learn from them prove to be good. But do you want to be in a setting in 2021 to where there's an outhouse out back and you're having to go draw water from a well and uh, such conveniences that forced you to grow and learn chores and be toughened up because of those circumstances? Or do you think maybe your children did okay having some modern conveniences? 
The good old days don't have to always be that way. And don't find yourself saying that. He's not saying you can't ever say it, you can't ever think that. But don't think absolutely that the good old days are always better. That's not always true. Some of the modern conveniences and lessons learned are good lessons learned. Um, just stay away from that thinking in an absolute sense. And that's not suggesting that there aren't some good things from our past. I hope you see that. But he's just suggesting that we don't make that the way we respond to most things. Because there are a lot of blessings. Uh, I don't know where our world would be without some of the conveniences that have come about just in our lifetime, the last 40, 50 years, your adult years. Uh, I forgot the wording now, it's been so long. But when the computer guys came up with the zero and the one and certain, Russell, do you remember what it was called? Let's see it. Yeah, the binary code, I think. Uh, but that doesn't seem like what I was thinking. But those who came up with the idea of having so many ones and zeros put together to tell a printer what to do, and it's an amazing thing. And of course, think of what it is now. Uh, how can you explain today of sending a 40 page document? in five seconds to someone across the United States. Email. How do you explain that? I, I don't know how to explain it. I can't. How do you explain that? Uh, how do you explain some of the things we have that enable us to talk and communicate so quickly and easily with family members in other places? Maybe Eric and Wendy, five years in Rwanda, us in China getting to talk to Tanya every week and Eric and Gregory regularly on Skype. How can you explain that? Would you ever want to go back? Uh, when they would get in the car in South Florida, drive to Harding 21 and a half hours without a cell phone, would we do that today? Would you even consider doing that today? We had no choice. I do not loan for the good old days. When my grandson leaves Edmund to drive to Surthy, a lot closer, but he in constant communication if he needs to be. How do we ever not realize the goodness of the times that we live in? Solomon is suggesting that we need to realize that and not suggest that the good old days are always the best. They weren't always the best, but we learn from them. We benefited from them, and that's the other lesson. Wisdom, verse 11, like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. So not just the immediate, but what's next. What the next years are about, not just the immediate is really the concern. But I like verse 13 and 14. These verses uh, come up, I think, when you study Proverbs and some of the lessons from this book. Consider what God has done. And he's going back to God in the pictures, not under the sun, with God out of the picture. It's God in the picture. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. He's addressing the person who would say, I know everything. I know it all. 
And he's saying, you don't know it all. You don't know what your future will hold. And there are some things in life that are crooked by God's design, and you can't straighten them. And don't think you can. And there's a reason they're crooked. There's a benefit to being crooked, he's implying. So when things are good, be happy. When they're not so good, well, consider that too is from God. Both came from God, the sad and the glad. And the conclusion, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Uh, there's balance. There's balance in life. And uh, verse 14, we just don't know our future. Do you know where you're going to be next Sunday? You know where you plan to be. You're wise to make plans. And you're disciplined enough to hope that you have an understanding. Uh, one Wednesday night, as a 32-year-old 30, uh, assistant minister, I listened to Brother Clavenger lead the closing prayer at the Brainerd Church of Christ in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, it's the Clavenger who wrote the books but uh, Eugene Clevenger, I think, was his name, and he has a son that has written some songs that are in some of our older song books. But I listened to him lead the closing prayer, attended his funeral on Saturday afternoon, and he prayed what all of us pray in principle, direct us and guide us and your will be done and bring us back at the next appointed time. That principle is prayed in most every closing prayer. Maybe not the exact words, but that idea. But it impressed me that we don't know where we're going to be. We just don't know. I hear children out there. We will stop.